Oh, you're here already? I'm Andy. Bob Goff asks this haunting self-reflection question. How is your life working for the people around you? This isn't a question we're used to answering. Usually we ask the question like this, how is my life working for me? Instead, how is your life working for the people around you? The people you work around, the people who you interact with in your community, the people at home. Think about that as we dive into our next installment of Love Is. I'm becoming more and more convinced that what our world needs, what our divided and confused world needs now more than ever, is love. And I'm not talking about let's all hold hands and stand in a line and do the Cupid Shuffle together kind of love. I'm not talking about feelings-driven love, but intentional, sacrificial, and proactive love. It's this different kind of love lived out by followers of Christ. And what we've been doing is spending time each week looking piece by piece at what this love looks like. And 1 Corinthians 13 has been our textbook. And so far what we've discovered is this, that love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. And let's catch what, what Paul says next about love. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. You see, behaving rudely and seeking its own really go together like peas and carrots, as Forrest Gump would say, right? Because what makes people rude? At the core, it's this idea that life is centered around me. Got a little joke for you. What does a selfish cow say? Me. <laughs> okay, I got another one for you. Maybe this one's a little bit better. What do you call a selfish sponge? Self-absorbed. Okay, one last one. Why are urologists selfish? If you don't know what a urologist is, don't Google it. Just trust me on that one. Why are urologists selfish? Because all they care about is number one. Okay. So what happens is a person who is self-seeking goes through life with one person in mind, themselves. Now maybe you've noticed this at work or in different settings that you find yourselves in, these self-focused people. I've noticed it in the church world, people say, I just wasn't getting fed at that church. Or they ask questions like, what programs does your church have to offer for me and my family? Or I really didn't like the experience there. I didn't like the coffee. I didn't like um, that I didn't know people there or whatever. You see, the mantra of the self-centered can really be summed up by the great 20th century poets Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. Here we are now, entertain us. I got the hair for it, don't I? Some of you are thinking, that guy's crazy, and others of you are like, preach it, brother. You see, most self-focused people wouldn't necessarily even know that they're self-focused, and they also don't recognize that they live their lives seeing people as objects to serve their needs. It's almost like they treat people like they are their Alexas, which reminds me, you know, I've been wanting to do this for a while. If you're watching online, would you turn the volume up on your device for a moment? Okay, got it? Alexa, order me some Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay, some of you hate me for that. <laughs> but, but the thing is, people become a means to an end, and the, the end is about meeting my needs. And because of that, I dehumanize people. You know, that cashier becomes one less hurdle for me getting to where I need to go, or that restaurant server is there to make my meal perfect, or that customer service representative is, is there to solve my problem right now in my way, or that person on the road is hogging 
my road. It's my road. I got to get where I need to go. You see, when I don't get what I think I deserve, how I think I deserve it, my self-centeredness shows up in rude behavior. Peter Cesaro points out that we start treating people as objects, as an it. In other words, I treat you as a means to an end, like I would uh, use a toothbrush or a car. Scazzaro gives us some, some examples of what this looks like. He says, I walk in and I dump my work on my secretary without saying hello. I move people around on an organizational chart at a staff meeting as if they were objects or subhuman. I talk about people in authority as if they were subhuman. I treat my spouse and my kids as if they were not in charge of their own freedom, dreams, and autonomy. I expect them to be the picture I have of them in my head. I am threatened when somebody disagrees with my political views. And then he goes on to say something pretty fascinating. He says that the result of I-it relationships is that I get frustrated when people don't fit into my plans. The way I see things is right. And if you don't see it as I do, you are not seeing things the right way. You are wrong. Doesn't that kind of pinpoint a core problem right now? in our society and even in our worlds so that we made people out to be subhuman or objects or an issue. And all the while in our me-centered thinking and resulting behavior, we have forgotten the humanity of the other. We become so focused on getting our way that we aren't even showing love. You see what the world needs now more than ever is the love of Christ lived out by his followers. See, Paul comes along and writes to the Colossian church, telling them, reminding them that they've been made new in Christ and that they need to put off the self-centered behavior of the world around them, that they're following a new pattern of behavior. And, and I want to walk through this particular passage. Starting at verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Look how he describes those of us who have decided to follow Jesus. He says that, that we're chosen people, and holy. And, I'm, and he's not saying that we're perfect, but what these words have to do with there should be a set apartedness in how we live our lives, that we are called to be different in how we live our lives. And he goes on to describe what that looks like, but then he calls us dearly loved. You see, the love of God is what defines us. And this is a vastly different kind of love than the world around us. This isn't based on conditions or feelings, but it's proactive, it's intentional, and most of all, it's others focused. And therefore, because we are called to be different in this world, Paul goes on to say, clothe yourselves. He uses this interesting term of basically putting on a different outfit, you know, dressing differently in how you live your life. I want to spend a few moments just going through quickly what he says to clothe ourselves with. He says, clothe yourself with compassion. Compassion is a deep attitude of concern for others. Kindness, he says, to clothe yourself with. And we spent some time in episode three discovering that kindness has to do with actively seeking and doing good for everyone, even when you don't feel like it. Then we're to clothe ourselves with humility. Humility is a lot of fun, isn't it? But humility has to do not with thinking less of yourself, but instead thinking of yourself less. It means thinking of others first, you know, and, and that goes so countercultural to, to our day and age, uh, thinking of others first. It's usually thinking about ourselves. C.S. Lewis once said something along the lines of, if you were ever to meet a humble person, you wouldn't know it because they would be so concerned about you. And so in addition to humility, Paul reminds us to clothe ourselves with gentleness. Now, gentleness isn't weakness, but it's power under control, recognizing that I don't need to fly off the handle. And then I clothe yourself with patience. In episode two, we, we spent some time on the subjects of patience, recognizing that it has to do with suffering a long time. Then Paul says in verse 13, bear with one another. Put up with one another. You know, this is what God does for us. He puts up with us so many different ways. Then we're to, what Paul says, forgive one another if they, any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. We're going to go deeper into this in the next couple weeks. Then Paul says in verse 14, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Notice these things involve putting on. It's a choice. It's behavior modeled after God and his love for us. So Paul goes on and, and, and describes specifically what that looks like in the church setting, but then he hones in on home relationships. And let me tell you, I've been putting off this message for a couple weeks now. I've been kicking and screaming with this particular message 
because love is not rude. It's such an easy concept for me to understand and I can, in public and professionally, I can be very polite and it's easier for some of us to be gentle and compassionate and patient at work or when we're out and about, but at home is a completely different story. And so if you go down in, in Colossians 3 verse 18, Paul gives us some instructions for family relationships. He says, wives submit your hu- yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I mean, don't be rude to them, you know, and, and husbands, you may be thinking, my wife knows I love her, you know, I've told her I love her, but, but there's something important that we got to catch here. And this might be the biggest takeaway of the entire message. Paul is making an important distinction here. It's not so much that you love people in your life, but it has to do with how you show it. And let me say that again. It's not so much that you love people in your life. It has to do with how you show it. You see, Paul could have just said, love people, but instead he gets specific and talks about things like gentleness and compassion, kindness and patience. And so Paul reminds husbands and really all of us, don't be harsh. Then he goes on and looks at some other family relationships saying, children, obey your parents in in everything for this pleases the Lord. Kids, that means don't be rude to your parents by disobeying what they tell you to do. Then Paul goes on and and talks to fathers and says, Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. To embitter means to stir up or provoke. The message paraphrase puts it this way. Don't come down too hard on them or it will crush their spirits. Reminds me of a picture I saw on Facebook this week um, that said, When you keep criticizing your kids, they don't stop loving you. They stop loving themselves. Man, I don't know about you and other dads out there, but I get so frustrated and angry. There's things that need to be said. And yes, it does need to be said, but how am I saying it? That's the question. Am I treating my children, my wife, like people or things? Okay, I've been feeling convicted enough. I think I want to walk out of here. I think we're going to stop here. But before we go, I want to go back to the question we started off this episode with. How is your life working for the people around you? Is there a way that you've depersonalized others, maybe treated people like an Alexa? Or is there a new set of clothes, a new way of life that you need to live? Maybe parents, how is your life working for the other people in your family? Remember this, it's not so much that you love people in your life, it has to do with how you show it. Let's pray. God, thank you for truly showing us what love is for demonstrating patience and kindness and sacrificial forgiveness in your son, Jesus. I pray that for those of us who follow you, Jesus, that we would live out this different kind of love, that we'd live it out at our workplaces, on our Facebook profiles, among those who serve us, and and, and what may be the most difficult place of all, Lord, at home. Help us not just to love, but to love well. Give us the strength to be who you've called us to be in this crazy, time and place that we find ourselves in. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to check us out. If there's a way we can pray for you or I can pray for you, drop me an email, andy at fayette.church. If you're looking to take a next step, maybe it's connecting with others, serving in our community, or or just growing in your relationship with God, head over to fayette.church slash next steps. On there, you'll find a whole bunch of ways to take that next step. And our desire with each episode um, is to equip you to take that next step toward Jesus. And so I pray that you would find the courage to take your next step toward loving others well this week. God bless.